As I stare at my computer screen, willing my hands to write the sermon, I try not to pay attention to the laundry in front of me that needs to be put away. I also try to ignore Rosie and Annabelle fighting over a couch cushion beside me, feet and faces both yelling, stop it, stop it. And just as I start to focus, Sophie asks me to babysit her bearded dragon, Lilo, while she goes to the bathroom. And she plops Lilo on my shoulder, so now I have a bearded dragon staring at me while I try to write. So I finally move myself into the kitchen to find quiet. And Rosie follows me there to get a snack And soon I hear crunching in my ear as she eats Doritos and stares over my shoulders and tries to read what I'm writing. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Around the corner I hear a drawer open in the living room and I realize the girls have discovered where I hid the recorders. And Rosie runs into the other room, joins her sisters in playing hot cross buns over and over again. And I stare back at my my computer screen, wondering how I'm ever going to think a coherent thought. I call the girls back into the kitchen, and I let them know that it's time to get back to schoolwork, realizing it's noon and Lily isn't even up yet. And I soon find myself elbow deep in second grade math and language arts and a fifth grade book report. And finally, when the day's homeschooling is done, I get this sudden urge to bake a batch of cookies. What is it about this self-isolation that has caused us to bake so much? Two batches of cookies later, I once again sit down at my computer screen and stare at it. How in the world am I going to write anything deep and meaningful and life-changing cooped up in this house day after day? (laughs) The walls of the house seem to be closing in on me, and I hadn't washed my hair for four days. I'm worrying about all the people I know who are sick with COVID-19 and still grieving the ones I have lost. Just a month ago, a month ago, I was with my church, worshiping and singing and laying on of hands of a broken person who wanted to be made whole. And I remember the power of it coming into this place. It was beautiful and there was healing. Those moments together were so amazing and powerful. But in my cooped up space in my house, I'm unable to focus and honestly, I feel lost. How could God breathe any life and power into this cooped up space? And I wonder, the disciples felt this way, cooped up together in the upper room. (laughs) After Jesus' betrayal, the disciples flee to the upper room, their safe place to hunker down. They were afraid to be captured and face a death much like Jesus's. And so for days and nights, The Bible says the disciples stay behind locked door in one room. And hearing about the death of their friend, their teacher, the one they knew was sent by God, brought an atmosphere of loss, fear, and hopelessness. And being cooped up together during a stressful time is not fun. The disciples probably found their tolerance level for each other fading. Possibly Peter won't stop talking. (laughs) 
going over the events, going over what he did. Maybe James and John snore so loud they wake everybody up at night. Maybe Andrew can't chew his food without smacking it. A few of the disciples were probably so depressed they couldn't move from the corner of their room. And the room is probably hot and stinky from lack of being able to open the doors and bathe. These men who were once one-on-one -on -one with God every day are now feeling abandoned and lost. How could God breathe any life and power into this cooped-up space? Your cooped-up space probably feels the same. There's nowhere to go, no parks to play at, and this week's cold weather kept us in. We too, like the disciples, are hunkered down behind locked doors for our safety and the safety of others. And even those who work in public are hunkering down any moment they can. And in the last month, you've probably baked all of your grandmother's recipes and eaten them, or you've given somebody else a haircut, or you've cut your own hair, <laughs> much to the dismay of your children. <laughs> you've probably read every news article on COVID-19 there is, and you've probably watched every season of Antique Roadshow. And your tolerance of those you live with is probably thinning. I found this meme. It says, oh, look, it's my wife's last nerve. I want to touch it. You're tired of being cooped up. The walls are closing in on you, and you have no energy left. You're feeling lost and frustrated. How could God breathe any life and power into this cooped-up space? I went to God with that question in prayer, and I hunkered down with my Bible and searched in desperation for answers. And what God began to speak beyond the crunch, crunch, crunch of Doritos in my ear was beautiful. So here's what I found out. We have a God that is amazing at doing great work in cooped up spaces. Let's just take a look at the space the disciples are in from our scripture today. They were in the upper room, also known as the cynical. This room was located in the southern part of Jerusalem, and according to tr tradition, this is where the disciples stayed when they were in Jerusalem. It was like their home base. In this very space, the Last Supper took place. This is where Jesus washed the disciples' feet and taught them how to be a servant. In this room, Thomas's faith emerged after Jesus let him touch his wounds. And in this space is where tongues of fire appeared to them on Pentecost and went over them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And it is in this room where we find the disciples in our scripture today, hunkering down and waiting. John twenty nineteen. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together and the, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. So out of nowhere, Jesus pops into the room and offers them something you and I are longing for and they had been longing for, peace. 
Jesus entered this cooped up, cramped space with his disciples. He sees his once full of life disciples drained and not sure what to do with themselves. After the disciples see his wounds, the scripture says that they're overjoyed at seeing him, yet they must be still perplexed and struggling because Jesus offers them peace again. And then he does something he has never done before. John 20 says, He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Wait, what? I thought this only happened at Pentecost. But it's happening here in this cooped up, cramped room. Here in this room where all hope has been lost. Jesus is now restoring them. And the Holy Spirit, he had told them about back in John 14, the helper from God is now here. Here are some of the things Jesus told them about the Holy Spirit in John 14. He says, the Holy Spirit will teach you everything. The Holy Spirit will remind you of everything that I have ever told you. So as Jesus breathes on them, it all comes back. Everything that he had taught them and shown them. What a beautiful moment to be reminded of God's goodness and power. And then Jesus also says this about the Holy Spirit in John 14. I can guarantee this truth. Those who believe in me will do the things that I am doing. And he even says more. He says, they will do even greater things because I'm going to my Father. So look, look at what happens in this cramped room full of isolated disciples. Jesus breathes life and power into this cooped up space. So I want you to think. Think about your cooped up space. I want you to look around your room now. The room you're in, your living room, your kitchen, your bedroom, wherever you are. Look around. Maybe you see laundry piled up. Maybe you notice the animals you're sharing it with, the people all the messes. Notice maybe you're in your bathrobe. (laughs) Maybe you haven't brushed your hair or your teeth. Think about how many hours you have spent in that space cooped up. Now, as you look around, ask this question. Can God breathe any life and power into this cooped up space. It is time for us to stop looking at this space as some kind of purgatory, as some kind of waiting space until we're free again, a a space full of loss and frustration. Fence, this cooped up space is a place of power. And we happen to have a God who can do great work in cooped up spaces. So instead of viewing this time of quarantine and social isolation as a time of waiting, what if we viewed it as an upper room experience? as the time that Jesus entered our cooped up, cramped up space with us. And in one breath, he pushed away all our fear and hopelessness and restored us. In one breath, we found our soul and that had felt so dormant a minute ago, now stirring to life like never before. In one breath, 
A power enters our cooped up space and our and it enters our bodies and gives us the ability to forgive, to heal, to uplift, to prophesy, to teach, to preach, and to praise like never before. So today, I'm going to pray that Jesus pops up in your room and breathes on you and offers you peace and you find life and power into your cooped up space. So Lord... <laughs> We all ask the question, can you breathe life and power into this cooped up space? Can we quit looking at this space as a place that we have to just wait it out, but realize that this time can be so powerful. This is the time in which Jesus restored them, and then they went out into the world and told of the gospel. This is the time you build us up and remind us of who you are. So I pray in the name of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, breathe on us where we are. Fill us with life once again. Fill us with this power that makes us want to stand up and lift our hands and praise you for this time in this cooped up space can be life changing and life giving. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>